everyone, and welcome to Book Break. I am Claire. I'm a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and I run the As the Page Turns and the Historical Group on Facebook. Today, I am joined by one of our newer librarians here, Rebecca, who is going to be doing the Pints and Prose Book Club. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh. Well, as you said, I'm going to be um, doing Pints and Prose, and so I've been thinking about, you know, some of the books that we might read on there, so I'll be talking about that a little bit. That sounds good. Yeah. What kind of things do you typically like to read, Rebecca? Um, I like to read nonfiction. I like to read true crime. I have heard that this book club um, likes thrillers a lot, so I'm kind of getting into that. Okay. Yeah. That will make you highly loved if you at least put a couple of thrillers on the list. There'll so, be a couple. All right. So uh, speaking of thrillers, I have a couple mysteries to talk about today. So I am going to get started with my first one, which was a title that um, our co-librarian Stephanie talked about a couple of weeks ago when we did uh, What We're Looking Forward to in 2023. This one is called City Under One Roof by Irish Yamashita. And this starts out with a bang. You have a group of teens that are walking along the beach, and one of the young girls named Amy finds a severed hand and a foot on a local beach in Alaska. So it gets more interesting when you realize that this town in Alaska is very removed from most of the state. It's accessible only through a tunnel, which causes a lot of problems in the winter because they are literally cut off from civilization if they have a bad storm. So the story is told from the point of view of three protagonists. We have Amy, who is the young teen that finds the body parts, and her mother runs a Chinese restaurant within the, in the little complex of the town. Uh, there's a detective named Kara, who is on leave from a larger city in Alaska, I believe Anchorage, and she is investigating this crime for her own personal reasons because her husband and child were murdered and mm. mystery was never solved. And then you have a young woman in the building. Her name is Lonnie. She has seen more in life than she should have. She has spent time in a psychiatric facility, and she's very damaged. So it's unusual to hear from the three points of view from, from the different people. And then there's other characters as well. There's a young detective that actually works at this town. His name is Joe, and he kind of develops a, a relationship maybe with Kara. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. So... Uh, First of all, it's kind of like a closed room mystery, mm -hmm. only it's set, you know, within the confines of the town because you have the weather element. You have a little bit of kind of psychological things going on. Also, a lot of people that live in this town are not here for the beauty of Alaska. Mm -hmm. They're mostly running from something or someone. So you have a lot of people with secrets in this building. Right which adds, of course, to the mystery as to why these body parts were found on the beach. They kind of try to explain it away in the beginning, like, oh, it was someone that jumped off a cruise ship. You know, it wasn't anything to worry about, but we know that's not the case, you know. So um, the, the book kind of had me at Alaska. And then once I got into the mystery, it was a very fast read and hard to put down. So it was a lot of fun, I have yeah. to say. Um, I like the characters, and I... I hope that this author, this was the first book uh -huh. that she's written. She's actually a screenplay writer, I believe, in Hollywood. Oh. So I'd like to see this series continue with these characters. And the way it ended, it seems like that is highly probable. Right. So, yeah. So if she's a screenplay writer, she probably has a really strong plot. Yes, definitely plot driven. But interesting characters and quirky characters kind of gave off what was that show from that was set up in the north that was kind of northern real, exposure yes yes mm -hmm. kind of a little bit northern exposure vibes right so yeah so what's your first one for us rebecca 
Okay, so since um, during the last time we had Pints and Pros, we were talking about uh, Jessica Broder's Nomadland. Mm -hmm. I think her name is Broder, isn't it? I believe Bruder. so. Jessica Bruder. Yeah. So, um, and so that was the story where she like travels around with all these retirees and people who are like living in their cars and living in their vans and trying to like find a way to survive doing different kinds of temporary jobs and stuff. So I decided I would start reading some other things in that genre. Mm -hmm. And I came upon this book, which is called Travels with Elizabeth, Three Years on the Road and on the Streets by Lars Einer. And this book came out in 1993, and this is like a, a true memoir of a few years when he sort of, it's in the 80s, when he's traveling around with his dog, who is Lisbeth, and basically traveling between um, Austin and Los Angeles and trying to find work and trying to find a place to live. He loses his job. His job is like he works in a, at a mental institution. Mm -hmm. He's not able to get another job. He doesn't have a college degree. He doesn't have money, resources. He doesn't have anything to help him. Social services doesn't want to help him. So he's just sort of wandering around and trying to find work. And his job that he does is sort of his side gig that he's trying to make his, his job is working, uh, writing gay erotica. <laughs> so he like <laughs> actually goes to Hollywood and writes a few screenplays there, you know, not blockbuster screenplays. And it's, so it's all about what he does. Like at one time he's like living in like um, a stalk of bamboo. He puts up a, a little tent around there so he can live there. He talks a lot about dumpster diving for food. Yeah. Like what kind of uh, food is okay? How to tell if it's okay? What is the best time to dumpster dive? Which he says is like right when the college students have left because like uh, Austin has, you know, University of Texas there. Right. So right after they leave, they're like throwing out all the good stuff. Oh, or, yeah. You know, I, when, I can imagine that. When dad comes to visit, they're throwing out the booze and the drugs and anything else he's not supposed to know about. So he talks about that a lot. And there are some little adventures. Like at one point, uh, a dog catcher actually takes Lisbeth into custody because she like nips at somebody. Oh, no. So she gets taken into custody and, and put away for like 10 days because I guess they have to make sure she doesn't have rabies or something. So that's when he like... Um, breaks his promise that he's not going to panhandle. So he goes around and panhandles because he needs to get $100 to get her out of jail. So okay. even even though they they like have to like keep her there for 10 days, he has to then pay the $100 for her room and board for the 10 days. So he talks all about that. And it does have a happy ending. Okay. And uh, nothing bad happens to Elizabeth. I did, um, I confess, I went all the way to the end to check just to make sure. Right. Because I, I hate to read a book and get, like, all emotionally involved oh, you with can't, the animal. Oh, you can't and, lose the animal. No. Right. So I just wanted to make sure it does have a happy ending. Okay. So it was a really interesting book. Yeah. I know you and I talked about Nickel and Dime, too. Nickel and Dime by Barbara Ivanreich, which is really interesting, sort of a sociological experiment when she, she tried to see if it was, like, actually possible to make it just like working at minimum wage and not having any resources, not having anybody to help you. And she found out it was pretty much impossible. Right. There's no way to crawl out of that. No. No. Nope. You dig yourself a hole and then you can't get out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of good memoirs and journeys like that to read about. So. Yeah, a couple of older ones are um, George Orwell did one that's called Down and Out in Paris and London. Okay. And he was sort of um, he was sort of a sociological experiment. So he went to Paris. He was working as a waiter, but he like he didn't he deliberately didn't have any money. So he was always having to do things like go out and. Um, pawn his jacket so he could buy something to eat and then he'd get a little money and go to his jacket bag. That was just like a way of life. So that one was really interesting. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, my next one, I'm going to change direction a little bit and end with another kind of mystery thriller. But this one was called A Quiet Life by Ethan Joella. This was a very character-driven book. So I don't think it will work for everyone because it was kind of a quiet book, kind of slow moving, um, and definitely a grief mem kind of a grief book. So we have three different characters. It's set in a small town in Pennsylvania. The first person that the book kind of goes into is a man named Chuck, who recently lost his wife, Cat, due to cancer. They take an annual trip to Hilton Head every year, and it's coming up upon that time, and he's finding it very difficult to think about taking that trip without her. 
and he also is not really doing too well with his daughter wants him to clean up the house and start sorting through his you know his wife's things and maybe mm. getting rid of stuff and you know just starting over and he he doesn't want to he's just kind of mired in the past um there's another character her name is ella and this is the one that really grabbed me her daughter riley was kidnapped one day from school and it was a parental like abduction mm. she was separated from her husband um so she is was left with nothing She's now in an apartment. She's trying to, she works at a bridal store. She's also delivering papers. She is working herself to death and also trying to keep her daughter's case alive with the local police. And then we have Kristen, who was a young woman, probably in her 20s, and her father was murdered in a senseless act at a gas station just kind of a random shooting type of thing he was in the wrong place at the wrong time mm -hmm. she was very successful she was on track to go to veterinary school and after this happened she's just it's like her life has stopped she can't really deal with the grief of losing her father she can't really seem to make herself move forward so she's working at a local animal shelter and has put her dreams of veterinary school on hold because she just can't seem to make herself do anything. Um, so these three people, of course, what happens is their lives start to converge. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is a little believable. Some of it, not so much. You know, you know, it's kind of contrived a little bit. But yet at the same time, when their stories intersect, it is very hopeful, and they all do kind of find some kind of redemption in one another, and also they're able to move forward with their lives. So that was good. So if you're in the mood, I would say, for a people story, uh -huh. um, this would be a good book for you. He has um, written another book that also got like great reviews. So uh -huh. I got this one through Book of the Month Club, and I have to say that it was... You know, I read through it pretty quickly and enjoyed it, but it was a nice winter book, you know, kind of sitting in a cold day and reading about all these people and hopefully having their, you know, lives turn out okay, mm -hmm. so. Okay, so as I said, I've been looking at thrillers a little bit, and one that I just read for the first time uh, was, is by Jean Hanf Korlitz, and it's called The Plot. This is, does not have a movie made of it. I'm avoiding books that have been made into movies. Okay. So uh, this is about a person who, um, his name is Jacob Finch Bonner. And so he was um, like a very promising first novelist, got lots of praise. Second novel, not so much. Third mm -hmm. and fourth novel didn't get published. And so then he starts um, teaching so he's teaching aspiring writers. And there's a lot of satire there about the writing life and about the academic life and about the kind of people that are coming in, you know, to be taught writing or who think that they're going to, you know, be writing great blockbusters or right. something like that. So um, what happens is one of his students, who's very obnoxious, tells him the plot of his privately tells him the plot of the novel that he's working on. And he says, this is such a great twist to this plot that anybody could write it and it's going to be a be bestseller. There's, no, there's nothing else that could happen. So a couple years down the road, um, Jacob's life has become even more dismal and he's still teaching, but he's sort of like still, you know, sliding downhill to like, you know, now it's just like, um, now he's teaching online rather than teaching face to face. And he finds out that this student of his has died. And this, the book never came out. So he's checking online to see if this book was ever published or anything like that. It hasn't. So he decides that he's going to write it. Right. Because it has such an unbeatable plot that it's going to be a bestseller. And true to form, just as you would expect, yes, it is. So, you know, he, it becomes a bestseller. He becomes really famous. And it's an Oprah book of the week. And he's touring around and stuff like that. And then somebody starts posting on social media kind of mysterious items saying 
he's a thief, calling him a thief, calling him a plagiarist, saying he stole that plot. So now he's trying to find out what happened. So the actual book that he has written, stealing the other person's idea, is called Crib. And so some excerpts of that are actually published in this book. And then you find out what the plot was, the amazing twat plot twist in Crib. It's, it's not actually that shocking. If you ever saw like a film noir or something, you would have guessed it. But anyway, so the, the book plot also has a plot twist. But I'm not going to say what it is or even hint at what it is. No, that was good, though. I think I read this one. Oh, you read this one? Yes. It was good. Yeah. And uh, I, I th for somebody that likes a thriller, I think that one will be really popular because it is twisty. Um, and people that like thrillers tend to really like like a twisty ending. Right. But, um, yeah, and it it's very suspenseful when he starts getting those messages because it's you're right. thinking... Oh my gosh! Who could it be? Did the if the guy's dead? Who is this? You know who who is this? obviously someone that knows this story. You know so. Yep. So he's trying to figure it out, and and you're trying to figure it out, and Stephen King says it's insanely readable. Yeah. Oh, how can you beat that? A Stephen King recommendation. Yeah. All right. So right along those lines, I am going to dive into my last one, which was on my list of books I was looking forward to in 2023. It is called All That Is Mine I Carry With Me by William Landay. And William Landay also wrote a book called Defending Jacob, which was another legal thriller murder mystery that I think became a series on Apple TV, possibly. Um, and I can definitely see this book eventually becoming a series as, or some kind of series or movie. But um, this book is divided into parts, and it starts with an author telling you about how he got out of his writer's slump by meeting with an old friend from his private school days in Massachusetts who wants to share his mother's story. To be honest, the way this prologue was written... I thought at first I had like the wrong book. I was like, wait a minute, is this a true crime? You know, is that what I'm reading here? I mean, it was so compelling the way he wrote this shadow author like introduction. Um, so it, it's almost like he used an, an alter ego voice to write the book. So picture this, it's November, 1975. Young Miranda Larkin comes home from school one day to find her house empty. Nothing is amiss. She waits and waits, but her mother just never comes home. From the beginning, the police detective that was assigned to this case is suspicious of the woman's husband. Um, and he is an attorney named Dan Larkin. He's represented some crime lords, and he knows a bit about murder and due process. So after a short time, his wife disappeared, he's already brought his mistress into the house, but there's no evidence against him. There's no corpse, there's no blood, there's, there's no signs of a struggle or foul play. So the three children are, are kind of caught in this bind as to a lot of people in the community think this man is guilty. Um, his oldest son always sides with the father. He's He's the oldest. He's about ready to go to college. So I would say he's the least one affected by the mother's disappearance. The middle child, which is a young man named Jeff, and the youngest daughter are the ones that are, their lives are pretty much destroyed by this. Neither one of them can have a normal life. The daughter struggles with depression for most of her life. And the son has a, a commitment problem. Like he can't really commit to anyone or anything. So after all this time goes by, now suddenly Jane's, the mom, her body is found. And it's found in a location where the family used to vacation. So now the family is forced to come to terms with this all over again. The, the suspicions all come back. Whether or not this, this man is guilty... Will there be a criminal trial? Will there be a civil trial? Will the children side together? Or will they splinter apart because 
they don't know what to believe. Um, I thought this book was less of a thriller and more of a psychological family drama. Mm. So it, it also is something that you believe could happen in real life because a lot of times the evidence is not so clear cut. Like you're not just lobbed the perfect amount of evidence. You know, you have a body that's found 20 years after the fact. A lot of, you know, DNA at that time wasn't prevalent. So you really don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. And of course you have like crazy people saying, oh yeah, I killed her. I was in the area at the time. You know, it just brings all the people out of the woodwork. So I think this would make a great book eventually for a book discussion uh -huh. because of the family impacts, you know, the psychological impacts, the father, like just analyzing the different characters in this book. And it does have a wallop of an ending. Oh. Like you'll, you'll come to decide like what you think, but then at the end, you kind of, you kind of find out you're not a hundred percent sure you're finding out, but um, yeah, it was really good. Wow. What was the name again? It was called All That Is Mine, I Carry With Me by William Landay. Okay. And I believe this guy was an attorney, too. Uh -huh. So he's got that part totally down, right. you know. That's L-A-N-D-A-Y, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what is your last one that you have for us? So the last one I was going to talk about is another thriller. This one is called The Silent Wife, and it's by A.S.A. Harrison. Also, not made into a movie yet. So it's about a couple whose uh, relationship is kind of winding down. They're a well-to-do couple, and they live in Chicago. They don't have any children. They've been together for 20 years. And he's kind of a philanderer, and she sort of puts up with it. And this uh, story is told in alternating chapters, much like Gone Girl, where we first of all have her viewpoint, and the next chapter is his viewpoint, mm -hmm. and it goes back and forth. And of course, there are lots of little secrets. There are like things that she knows, and there's like things that he doesn't know. Okay. And so on. So you know, actually, within the first few pages, you actually know who the killer is. Okay. And you know who the victim is, but you have to well, like read to the end of the book to find out what. Um, who it is, what happens. And it was very, um, it was really well written. I found it really um, fun to read. Okay. I like a good thriller sometimes. Mm -hmm. Does the title have anything to do with, a, with the content of the story or is that meaningful in any way? Yeah, I think the content of, well, it, it does actually, it has to do with some psychological things with, with her past that come out later on as you're reading the book. And also just the fact that she's sort of like, kind of like a passive character in some ways, and she just sort of like quietly goes along and, and puts up with things. But then, you know, there's, there's, um, there's some twist to it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Did you like Gone Girl? Did you read Gone Girl? I loved that book. Okay. I thought it was really well written, and it was actually like about 100 times better than the movie. I agree. I thought the movie really dropped the ball on that one. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. I got to the point where I thought, I hate both these people. <laughs> right. Why don't they both just die? You know, <laughs> that yeah. was bad. But um, yeah, Jillian Flynn pretty much opened the door for that type of psychological thriller. I uh -huh. think that once Gone Girl came out, it was like a plethora, and some some are better than others. You know, right. what was that one the girl on the train? Yes, Paula Hawkins. That was wild too. Yeah, oh, I didn't read that one. Yeah. yeah. And the movie was actually pretty good with that one, too. Yeah. So. Wow. So, all right. So, so I guess I'll continue reading more thrillers. <laughs> yes. Read more thrillers. I, You know what? I always will discuss a good mystery or, or thriller. So. You sounded pretty interesting. Which one did you think was the best? The the one I ended with. The oh. all, all I have, all that is mine, I carry with me. I felt like the first one... The, the um, Alaskan one was fun. It was a quick read. I I felt like it was very much set up to be like a serial. Um, very entertaining, but I don't think it quite had the depth of, of the last one that I talked about. The all, yeah. I actually like this one. I read Defending Jacob, and I liked this one a lot better. I thought mm -hmm. it was a lot more well done. With Defending Jacob, I was like, Dear God, your son is just stop, stop protecting him. You know, I, I really got irritated with that one. Was but, it the same author? Mm hmm. Oh. Yeah. 
but all right well thank you so much for joining us with book break today you can follow us or find us on our website you can stream us on any of the apple podcast or whatever you listen to your podcast and thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time book break is a production of the reese public library made possible through the support of the friends of the reese public library theme music composed and performed by sean greif